But it, it's, it's a great tool. It, yeah. it helps people uh, see that, I don't want to say the stupidity around you, but the, maybe it's insanity yeah. of, of do it this way, do it this way, do it. Why? There's a better way. You know, to standardize work, we, we tell people it's the current best documented method of doing every task. Current because hopefully we're going to do better. We're going to figure out a new way in the future. But today, this is the best way. Uh, documented because if it's not written down, I could run into a tree tonight and that knowledge is gone. Yeah. We lost it. So yeah. you've got to have it documented. And it's best because, again, continuous improvement. We hope that we do better. U utilizing the team's knowledge and experience, you're going to come up with a better way to do that task. Yeah, well, certainly when uh, when I was first e exposed to it, so the one the one we have um, is actually the one that came from the NUMI facility um, and all that. And uh, the way I came about it is uh, Jeff Liker. Um, I was talking to him, and he told me he had this uh, guy that originally worked for Toyota that I should meet him sometime, Stephen Sweeney, who who owns the one from NUMI now, um, the one we have. Um, and I said, yeah, I'd you know, love to meet him. He goes, well, I'm... I'm having one of my classes, one of his MBA classes, is going to do a, a lean simulation on a simulator Steve has. Why don't you come up to that and you can meet Steve and, yeah. and see the simulation? And I thought, oh, great. You know, I get to meet Steve. You know, I've seen all kinds of lean simula sim simulations, you know, with Legos and yeah. other things like that. So I wasn't really thinking much of the simulator. I just was interested in, in meeting Steve and, you know, getting to see Jeff up in Michigan. Well, I came up there. Well, when I walked in the room and saw this thing, the, the, the physicality of it, mm -hmm. the design of it, I was shell-shocked. I obviously never seen anything remotely like that. And this, as I learned more about it, and I went up there again to just go through one of the, one of the classes, mm -hmm. just the, I'm going to say, give credit to you and your team, how well it is, is designed to be able to allow people to experience that. It is a very well-designed um, simulator to give that experience. So um, my whole drive back after I saw that the first time coming back to Indiana, I had a, I had a million ideas running through my head on uh, how many different ways you, can, I, you, you could utilize this for excellent training. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of got, got us launched with it, is when I got back and thought about it, I thought about the training within industries um, job instruction in particular and then a few days later I called back up to Steve and just said hey I have an idea for a workshop would you be interested in this thinking of the training within industry he said yeah absolutely and then the other group we brought on board was the TWI Institute training within industries Institute um, I told them I said you got to come see the simulator you aren't gonna yeah. believe it and uh, and oh by the way I have an idea on how we might <laughs> be able to utilize that so that's kind of how we got launched but yeah um, you guys did an excellent job of designing this for that experience. Yeah, it's ironic that there would be one at NUMI because, you know, that's where Toyota's yeah. where the whole concept, the Toyota operating system started. But uh, you know, yeah, don't I reinvent think, the wheel. If there's yeah, a good I tool. I can't remember the exact number, but I think General Motors may have around 30 plus or minus some globally of, of these simulators yeah. they have out there now. So, yeah, you guys really certainly started something yeah. <laughs> with that. Yeah, and it's interesting the reason it started was to expose people to the concepts. Yeah. But I guess that's the best way you learn. I mean, it's yeah. is doing. Yeah. And we've always, you always say, a, a leader that can teach is better positioned to lead because if you can teach a subject, you demonstrate that you really understand it. And, yeah. And that was part of it too, is, is having the leaders of the organization take people through that so that their subordinates, if you want to call them that, although we like to look at that organization chart upside down, saw that they really understand what they're talking about. Yeah. This isn't just words, it's not something out of a book. He said, they're teaching me how to do it and, and they understand it. Yeah, and that's so true. Actually, the, as, as the TWI was developed during World War II, although its history goes back, uh, actually even a, a over a century before that, yeah. things that led up to it. But that was actually their m mantra too, was learn by doing yeah. as well. And that's, like I said, that the simulator really is a, an excellent example, tool, um, faculty in order to um, teach people things by doing. Yeah, I'd be curious to see how it's holding up. That was one of the tough things in the early design was fasteners were designed to fasten. Yeah. 
but this was this was by nature had to be assembled, disassembled, assembled, disassembled. Yes. Uh, well, I think that's one of the geniuses behind it is it can be it can be perpetually ran because yeah. it assembles and disassembles um, as as it goes around to do that. And and actually, I'll be anxious for you to come up and see it because obviously you know what the original <laughs> one was, and you can maybe see. I know yeah. Steve. When Steve got a hold of it, and he's actually by his vocation, um, although he did things in uh, in uh, management and operations, he's actually an electrical engineer by his uh, education. So he did a lot of improvements with some of the Andon system yeah. and things like that, yeah. some of the sensors and so forth, just because he had that background. So I'll be anxious to see what you think about it when, uh, when you get the opportunity to come yeah. see it. Yeah, because a, a lot of the electronics in that were, like I said, were cobbled together initially just, okay, how do we create <laughs> this notification and, you know, getting people going through that process thinking, well, Andon, I've, I've heard about Andon, it's a stop yeah. the line process. No, yeah. no, no, it's a keep the line running process. Yeah. You know, it's get you the help you need so we don't have to stop producing. It's not yeah. an excuse to stop producing. Highlight issues yeah. quickly and communicate it as promptly as possible in order to yeah. resolve. Right. Learn, learn and resolve as promptly as possible. Yeah, so getting that visual tool in front of people was just another one of those subtle things. That, yeah. Well, here's something you're going to have that's going to be a help for you in doing your job. That's... Uh, yeah. Well, that's that's fantastic. I, I appreciate you sharing that with us because it's such a, it's such an interesting story, such actually a historical story in a sense. Now, with uh, in this case, I know, like I said, I know General Motors has quite a few globally. I know actually Caterpillar, based off based off the design of the one Steve has, they've actually built. I can't remember exactly. I think I want to say they may have like maybe fifteen now. Caterpillar does right? globally. Harley Davidson uh, has, I think, a couple that they used yeah. based off of what you guys designed. So, and I think you mentioned you mentioned um, another company. Navistar. Navistar. Navistar has one over so, in yeah. Springfield. So yeah. Well, some of those companies you mentioned, I remember people that were part of our our operation there had moved on to those companies. Other so companies I'm not surprised brought that, that with them. The ideas went with them. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, you like I said probably did, like I said you guys probably were re working to resolve <laughs> your issues and concerns at that moment. Yeah. Probably had no idea how it proliferate out in uh, out in industry yeah. and, and st still is. And I guess that's one thing we're trying to do. Well, with and it beyond, you know, beyond yeah. the auto industry, it's uh, you know you do work with a lot of different businesses, and, yeah. and that was one of the things that intrigued me as I was teaching at U of M. Is you know we got a health center over there that's just got tremendous inefficiencies from the standpoint of all the different types of waste that you could attack if people really understood. Uh, flow you know what's the product who's a customer what how do we take waste out of this uh, accounting practices administration yeah. operations whether you're, you're on a nuclear submarine or making making over the road trucks the, the principles are the same yeah, they exactly. apply everywhere and that's what, that's what we try to do with it is is the simulator and it's like I said I'll say again it's an excellently designed simulator but it's really just the backdrop to teach these principles and practices and skills that are applicable in, in anything, whether it's healthcare, whether it be in automotive or manufacturing. Uh, we've had other people, I think, actually, that uh, that uh, um, publish books and things like that. I probably even had some people out of some service in industries like insurance, because we we're training to is the process and skills around it, so you could take that and apply it to anything. Yeah, I think two of my best students I, I remember were were in the Navy. Military officers were going through the master's degree. Uh, supported by the Navy, and boy, they really grasped. I mean, the, the concepts were just sucked up like a sponge. And when I commented to to one of them, it was a husband and wife team, I said, you know, you you really you're grasping this easily. And he said, well, when you're out in the middle of the ocean and you're in charge of a boat, he said, you don't want to screw up because <laughs> that's a, that's a career-ending decision as a call and say, my ship is busted, I need help. <laughs> you know, you want to have everything right all the time so that you don't have those kind of problems oh, yeah. uh, so it, it was it was enlightening to see that viewpoint yes from that uh, from that part of the the structure of the government to say here's here's our military that grasps it they understand it yeah. well with that is, is there any is there any other thing or any other stories you'd like to share oh golly um, well, the the culture stuff is always uh, 
intrigue me. I mean, having, you know, I, I said I managed plants in three languages. I had a yeah. plant in Montreal and in Quebec, so French was a language of commerce there. I uh, managed an operation in Mexico that was very, very rewarding. Uh, and seeing how the people were so proud of what they were able to do when they were engaged in, in these kind of yeah. ideas. I'll give an example from the plant in Montreal. Uh, I was making chimeras and firebirds. Uh, it was on just north of the island in a town called Bois Briand. Uh, St. Therese was the name of the facility. Okay. Uh, when I moved there, it, 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 in well-run operation, uh, very proud people, the Quebecois were actually treated Americans better than English-speaking Canadians, I think. <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, trying to embrace the language and understand the culture in that. Saw a very, very proud people, very, very proud of what they were doing and how they did it. But I, I noticed that they had this tradition in the operation of the plant of having what we would call float, repair float. I don't know if the term, in every operation, no matter how you good you are, you have some products that don't come out right at the yeah, end. Yeah. Uh, it might be something that's detected in an online driving test. Hey, this popped up in the engine. We didn't know it until it went through this test. It could have been something earlier in the process that you selected to say, hey, we're not going to stop everything to correct this now. It's more effectively corrected somewhere else so later so at so the some, end. Some in-process kind of rework. In-process in rework. We said, okay, we're gonna, we'll, we'll let the, we'll identify it, we'll flag it, we'll deer, we're going to deal with it later. So at the end of the process, you know, cars have been produced, and, and you've got some number of them that require some kind of review correction. Uh, and, and the plant, traditionally, as I looked at the numbers, had about 100 vehicles in the state. Not unusual, some plants had thousands. Uh, but it was always around 100. And, and I, I, I tracked every day what, what the throughput capability of this correction or repair operation was, and it, it was pretty stable. And I'm thinking, well, why are there 100? And, and many of these had to be parked outside because there wasn't enough room inside, inside the building the to store them all. Well, Montreal is a brutal, pretty brutal geography. And yeah. in the wintertime, they reminded me when I got there that 40 below zero is centigrade and Fahrenheit cross. It's the same. And it got there every February. And, and you could have one of these high-powered sports cars out in the yard. If it was slush and it froze, it was actually powerful enough to spin the rear wheels in the tires and blow the tires. Oh, right. And it happened. <laughs> you know, you, you, tires were frozen to the ground and and you tried to drive right out of them. I said, this is crazy. We've got cars that are outside in this environment. We've got a stable process. If it wasn't stable, I wouldn't have tried it. Yeah. But it was stable. I, I monitored it for, for several weeks and saw, yeah, their throughput's consistent, but there's always this 100 or whatever the number was. So there's got to be some, some constants Acceptance. in, in We that. accepted that we're going to have cars yeah. out in this repair yard. And the thing that bothered me was the bulk of the plant had to walk from the parking lot through that yard. There was a gate that they entered to walk th a short distance through that repair yard to get into the, to the factory. So th the first thing they saw every day coming to work was all these cars that had to be fixed. And the last thing they saw when they left work was all these cars that had to be fixed. So I, I, I gathered the operating staff together and I said, okay, in two weeks, that yard's going to be empty, and you're not allowed to put one out there unless you get permission from me. Oh, we can't do that. Well, yeah, you can. Look at <laughs> here's your numbers. Here's the number. I've been watching. I haven't been talking to anybody about it, but I've been monitoring. He said you're very stable. You're capable of a, 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 a stable process. Yeah. But you are accepting that there's going to be this number of vehicles out in that outside yard. So you got two weeks. You can work all the overtime you want this weekend and next weekend. Well, they only needed one weekend. They came in, worked Saturday and Sunday and emptied that yard out. <laughs> and I remember going out Monday morning out at the fence to watch people come into work. Get out of their cars, walk up the fence, and they stop. You kind of looked. Wondering where all the cars went. A little smile. <laughs> going to plant at the end of Monday, at the end of that shift, walking out at the gate, gate at the plant. First thing every day, or first thing everyone did when they walked out the door was look both directions to see if it was still empty. A smile on her face. 
next morning, come into work, see what the other shift did. Same thing. <laughs> we had them take pictures from the roof of what that yard looked like before with snow and everything. Yeah. Out. And then what it looked like yeah. after. Because people forgot what it was like. And then like a month later in the planned newspaper, we had a picture of remember what this used to look yeah. like. And uh, so from a culture standpoint, that was a simple thing that they took a lot of pride in. But they needed a little push to see that they could do it. They could do it, yeah. Because they always just accepted there's always going to be cars out there. Well, they don't have to. And, and it took a fresh mind, a fresh set of eyes to see the impact that was having on people that just reinforced the fact we're always going to have cars that have to be fixed sitting out in the snow. Well, you don't because you're capable. You just, yeah. you, you haven't, and you see that as a consultant. Yeah. You, you're, you're telling people what they already know. You just have to help them recognize help, it yeah. and accept it. Yeah, help them and, and, and actuate to get there because you yeah. know they can. Right, yeah. Okay, we'll do so. it. Uh, take the other culture, Mexico. I, I think we, we talked earlier about this. Uh, one of the, the two operations they had were steering wheels and instrument panels, made thousands of them. Uh, I forget the numbers now, but it was like 20,000 a day. So this was a component? It was a component operation, okay, yeah. Component two operation. operations. Okay. I, I, I had a, a component experience in Mexico, and, and the old guide lamp operation was part of at that time in Fisher Guide and Anderson, near where your oh, okay, simulator okay. is. Uh, the one of the the teams was making the S10 a small pickup truck yeah. instrument panel for all, all the plants in, in North America that made that product and a very efficient very high volume uh, and literally shipping product every yeah, day it was by rail uh, and, and just in time delivery to I think at that time it was three different assembly plants and, uh, for for just the S10, just for the S10 truck. So that was being that was being manufactured in three different plants. Three different plants in North America. Okay, so the instrument panel was coming out of the plant in Mexico. Yeah, yeah. So high, that very high volume. Yeah. yeah. So it, they were taking me on a tour of the area, and they were talking about some ideas they had for improvement. And I didn't grasp at the time that they were looking for approval or permission, and and. A lot of it was being done in, in Spanish, some of it was being done in English, and between, you know, I misunderstood what was being presented to me, and I praised them with the success that they had in evaluating all the different opportunities they had, and uh, we parted. It was, I think, on a Thursday. Uh, the next Monday, I'm walking, just walking around the plants, as did every day, and I walked up to this area, and I. I did a double take. It was completely relayed out, totally different than what it had been the previous Thursday. And, and I was shocked. And I looked and how all the different molding machines, uh, the, where the, the foam was put into the uh, yeah. sub-assembly and general foreman or general supervisor came up with a big smile on his face and beaming and I said, very different. And he said, yeah, yeah, we were so, so proud you gave us permission last week to do this. <laughs> they worked all weekend to completely redo this. It would have been disastrous if it was a failure because yeah. we didn't have enough stock in the pipeline to, to service those three assembly plants. It, it was very successful and it took a lot of waste out. It didn't have a lot of waste to take out, but they managed to find Fine. some more to take it out and made it even better. And it made me be extra cautious of what people are perceiving. Yeah. In, what they're trying to communicate versus maybe what you perceive yeah. they're trying to communicate. But, but an example of people that were so engaged and, and fully trained to understand what waste was and how to get rid of it and, and very, very proud to be successfully allowed to do it and the results that it had. Uh, good people, good people. But with, with the right support and, yeah. and the right training. Yeah. Yeah, well, good. No, it makes me think about but my, my days at, when I was at Briggs & Stratton, um, especially in reflection, um, those people that had been there, the people that were 20-some years were, were the youngsters, 20 to 30. Mm -hmm. I knew people at 40-some 40, 40 yeah. years working there. But I'll, I'll tell you what, I would... Uh, uh, and you, you have a whole variety of people, happy people, grumpy people, just all mm -hmm. that stuff. But I, I would have taken, I would have taken those people and and uh, gone with them anywhere and felt confident I could compete with anybody on, on the globe. Yeah. 
giving them the right environment and tools and support for them to be successful. Because I knew they had the, they had the capability. Yeah. I think everywhere it does. It's just yeah. a matter of what, what they've been a part of. Yeah, what they've been a part of. And even working with them over the years, and again, these things didn't enter my mind because you're just, which you know, you just get focused on. We need to get tasks done. We need to get these changes. We need to um, implement or uh, introduce something. Um, in hindsight, looking back, I probably, as an engineer, I was probably breaking, you know, union rules on a daily basis. But it was never an issue because, you know, working with the people and they knew I was there to help them as best I could yeah. is just to try to resolve the problem so they can do, do their work. So even though, you know, things that suppose I wasn't supposed to be doing, it was just, we were all focused on, let's try to make it so we can make as good a work environment uh, as possible. Yeah. And it makes, yeah. It, it makes a difference. That old. And, and the company of Briggs, from the management standpoint, with the union management, actually was very, very adversive, very adversive, but just working with the people out on the floor, it was, it was a non-issue. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think of an example. I had the operation in Anderson, Indiana, where near where you're located now, with the, the you call it less. Yeah. Uh, first day working there, just walking around this massive, massive operation with hundreds and hundreds of molding machines and illuminizers to put reflective coating on the inside of the tail lamp assemblies and the painting operations and different types of plastic welding operations and just the myriad of products that were yeah. produced for for dozens and dozens and dozens of customers and uh, i was walking around on second shift back in this long building where there were parallel assembly lines that were set up that were set up with high volume lines to produce a product that where the plant only wanted maybe one a minute this was producing three four five six a minute just because of the volume requirement and skilled trades that were changing all the fixtures on these little these conveyors so that this particular tail lamp could be built on that and then they'd build a whole bunch of them and send them off to storage and convert it over to build a different product and it, it was it, just incredibly complex well I, I was walking down and I, I saw one lamp it was it was it was a Buick Skylark tail lamp that was being assembled on this one line and I just walked over to a lady that was working on it and introduced myself as a new manager and uh, you know asked it, you know what her her job was and how how she was doing it and I said to her, you know who's the customer have you had any feedback from the customer plant that that uses this product and she looked at me and says what are you talking about and I said well the you know this tail lamp do you know what car this goes on she said no well it's a Skylark that's built you know in this plant. And she looked at me like, "What are you bothering me for?" <laughs> and I said, "I said, well, I've only been here. I think it was I've only been here six months or something. I, I, you don't expect me to understand. I, what do I care about that?" Yeah. And I'm thinking, "Oh my goodness, the people were totally disconnected from the customer." Yeah, from the customer. Yeah. I mean, it was a job, and they were getting paid a good wage, but it was do what we're telling you to do, don't question anything, and for heaven's sake, don't care about the customer. Yeah. And I thought, boy, this is, this is scary. Uh, but when you got people on an individual basis and you put them through some, some exposure, some training, some awareness, and saying, hey, you know, here, here's some different types of ways. Can you see ways we can make this better? Put in, you know, some little customer-focused cells. Uh, did a study of a Camaro tail lamp. And it, it sort of... I don't know why we picked that one, maybe because of the different steps. It had aluminizing in it, it had painting, it had different, it had a red lens, it had a clear lens, it had a base, so it was a number of different parts. Different departments molding different size molding machines, different kind of parts. Make a part, put them in baskets, ship them across into this big stacker system. Automatic storage retrieval system, massive, 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 holding millions of parts. And then pull those out when they had to go to the next step and, and send them back, pull them back. So there's this logistics yeah. system that's keeping track of all of these different parts at every stage of the process that all we want to do is make, make a tail lamp. And I said, well, add up all the distance that all of these parts have traveled from the time the pellets show up in the rail car until it's 
put on the rail car or the truck to go to the plant. In this case, it was up in Montreal. And uh, it was like six miles, six really? and a half miles that the pieces traveled within the factory. And I said, now all we want to do is, is make these half a dozen parts and put them together and put them in a box to go to the customer. To the customer. And, and they only need, they're making 60 an hour, we only need one part a minute. Uh, so we started doing some, some cells of taking areas that were no larger than, than your facility here and bringing molding machines and placing them in a U-shaped cell and make it, use it, assemble it, put it in the box. And, really and, and the, ready people, the, the people grasp it. I mean, it was so obvious and, and yeah. easy and they, we love it because we can see what we're doing. We see the finished product. We can relate to it. And they got to know who the customer was. But uh, too big an operation to, to get everything changed. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's sad to drive by there now and see yeah. that that's not even, not even, not even in not existence. Even there. So. But, uh, okay. yeah, concepts cool. apply everywhere. Yeah. So, well, well, thank you for coming in and, and talking with us, Bob. This is, this is great history, great information, great sharing yeah. your experience and knowledge with it. Uh, we appreciate that. Yeah. And we look for, like I said, look forward to having you come out there and, uh, and seeing, seeing this particular, um, I guess, version of what you guys created and yeah. see how it's being utilized. Well, and I'd encourage everybody that has an opportunity to utilize it, regardless of what your business is. If you're making a product, you're processing a product, whether it's paper or, or metal, uh, wood, whatever, uh, learn the principles. Take waste at. How do we best serve the customer? And how do we utilize the knowledge of everybody collectively uh, to do that. Focus on the customer, take out waste, you'll be successful. Good luck. Yeah. Glad to see the tools still being used. Yeah, thank you.